presence that made the difference. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Uh, revival. Definition of revival is just simply the restoration of the presence of God. Restoration of the presence of God. Well, we've always got, well, somebody goes, we've always got his presence. I've had people talk to me. Well, we've always got the presence of God. Yeah, I know. But the, there's times there's more. Revival is the inrush of the spirit into a body that threatens to become a corpse. I'll tell you what, when it looks like the church world is going under for the third time, there'll come a great revival, yeah. restoration of the presence of God. And that's what he's getting us ready, getting us, getting us ready for what he's getting ready for us. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, let's open our Bibles <coughs> to, um, how about let's open our Bibles to Mark's gospel. And uh, we'll go to the, let's go to the fourth chapter. Mark's Gospel, fourth chapter. And, uh, you know, we've been for months now. We're probably, we may stand this for months to come. But we've talked about um, doing the works of Jesus. You know, you go back to John 14, verse 12, where uh, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. I love that. He didn't say the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. He said, he that believeth on me. The works that I do shall he do also. I'll tell you, that we, we the church world, we've got to get hold of this. This, is, this thing's too big to keep it inside the four walls of a church. Church ought to be a training base, and the street ought to be an operation place. We ought to come in here. We ought to come in here. and We should have enough flow of the Holy Ghost in here, not just to entertain us, but to train us. The church ought to be a training base Amen. where we come in and, and, and not just go, oh, we, want to, we, we want to see signs and wonders in the church because that's really good. No, we ought to come in and say, because if I can see it, I can do it. Yeah. If I can see it, I can do it. There's just something about that. It ought to be demonstrated here and operated out there. And, and the thing is, you know, well, there's, what, 7.3 billion people out there. Now, again, you know, we just got back from, uh, just got back from Europe uh, Monday night. And, um, uh, you know, you go to, to Europe over there and, and uh, you know, people think, well, yeah, that can't be a mission field. Well, if you think that's because you ain't been there, because you can go to places that people consider the mission fields of the world and they've got 10, 15, 20% saved. You go to Europe, in many cases, they have about one half of 1% saved. People are either non-religious or very religious. They either got no religion or all kinds of religion, but the new birth is kind of few and far in between in a lot of these places. And so, uh, you know, um, you got this, basically, the, the continent of Europe clear over going east, or yeah, east of the Ural Mountains, the continent of Europe's about a billion people. And the thing is, you stop and think of a billion people where there's, you know, overall maybe 1% of the people really saved. We need, we need something to happen. But you're not going to do it by having just, you just, if you just get enough frontier evangelists, if you just get enough T.L. Osborns and Reinhardt Bonkies, we're going to get the job done. No, if you just get the church doing it, the church's job. That's what it's all about is, is uh, God, God raising us up to do what we're, what we're supposed to do, be what we're supposed to be, go where we're supposed to go, you know, hand of God's on every one of them. The minute you got born again, you got recruited to the kingdom of God, you got baptized into the body of Christ, you got a supply nobody else can bring, you're going to get to people nobody else is going to get to, and God's needing you to not just go witness, but he's needing you to be a witness, okay? So anyway, so... Um, we were, we, we've talked quite a bit about this, John 14, verse 12, where Jesus said, <coughs> verily, verily, he uses two verilies. That means he's serious about this. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than he shall he do because I go unto my Father. Now, the average Christian, if you said, well, you know, uh, 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 what works did Jesus do? Well, he, he healed the sick and cast out devils. Well, yeah, that's, that's part of it. But really, we've said over there in uh, Matthew 4.23, Matthew 9.35, both places, it said Jesus went round about their cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every manner of sickness and every manner of disease among the people. Now, that wasn't all there was to it, but the three main facets of the ministry of Jesus would be teaching, preaching, and healing. And when, now again, you ought to have this by now, when did the healing take place? After the teaching and preaching. When did the teaching and preaching take place? Before the, you're listening, this is good, before the healing. And what's happened is we haven't been doing the works Jesus called us to do because we've been trying to get shortcuts in there. We want to just run up and down the, the, the streets healing the sick. Jesus didn't even do that. 
randomly he'd walk up and deliver a miracle to somebody, the man at the pool of Bethesda or the, you know, the, the, the blind man in John chapter 9. He'd walk up and deliver a miracle. But as a general rule, about 75 to 80% of the time, Jesus would get people miracles into their lives by uh, attributed to their own faith. He said, daughter, your faith made you whole. According to your faith, so be it done unto you. O woman, great is thy faith. So about 75 plus percent of the time, maybe 78%, he attributed, either said or inferred that it was their faith that made the difference. And faith doesn't come, there's no shortcut for faith. You can fast and pray all you want. You're not going to get faith out of that. You can read books and hear testimonies. You're not going to get, yeah, if we just get enough good testimonies, you'll get faith. You don't get faith out of testimonies. The testimonies are good to encourage you. But the thing is, faith only has one avenue to come to the body of Christ, so then faith cometh, or to the world, so then faith cometh by, John, uh, uh, Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing. hearing and hearing by the word of God. So that's why Jesus went about teaching, preaching, and healing because he couldn't get them healed as a general rule until they had something to believe. And if they had something to believe and they'd believe it, then they'd get it. Okay. Well, if that's what worked for the master, then the servant's not going to go beyond that. So if we get hold of this, you know, our job's not just to run up to people and say, I can lay hands on you, get you healed. Well, that's great, but no use getting them healed if they're going to hell anyway. Okay? Our job's not just to get them healed. Our job's to get them into heaven. And one of the things that's going to help get them into heaven is that we have signs following us. We have supernatural calling cards. So anyway, as we've said before, you know, you've got 23, 25, 28, pretty much say roughly 28 um, healing miracles in the Gospels. Now, that's not everything Jesus did. The last couple of verses in the Gospel of John said, if everything Jesus did and said could be written down, I don't suppose the world itself could contain the volumes. We don't have a list of everything Jesus did. God somehow managed by the Holy Ghost, moved upon holy men of old as they're moved upon by the Holy Ghost. God somehow got people to write down, um, out of all the multitudes of miracles, they just picked out these 28. That's pretty amazing. I mean, there were times when the Bible said there was a great multitude out of, of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem from the sea coasts of Tyre and Sidon, which, which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And as many as touched him were made whole, for there went virtue out of him and healed them all. It's Luke's gospel. There's not, there wasn't a multitude. We, uh, how many is a multitude? Thank you, a lot. <laughs> so, how many would a great multitude be? A lot more. Okay. So it said there was a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, and they all came together to hear and to be healed of their diseases. And as many as touched him were made whole, for there went virtue out of him and healed them all. Them all got healed. So, you know, so, you know Luke didn't write down that, how, how many got healed. He just said they all got healed. So we don't have a listing of everything, which tells me God in his wisdom knew that in those, say, 28, roughly 28 healing miracles we've got in the Gospels, out of those, apparently everything you and I need to know about getting people healed and doing the works of Jesus must be contained in those 28. It'd do us a lot of good to just take those one at a time. And we may do that as we go along. We're kind of weaving in and out right now. But if we just took those, um, I found a book, um, oh, 35 years ago a book by uh, uh, A.B. Simpson. And, and I got to notice again there that he just took all the healing miracles of Jesus' ministry and he just did a couple paragraphs on each one. Well, I studied that for years. Finally taught on it. I taught on all the healing miracles of Jesus' ministry. But that was when everything was on cassette tape, maybe at eight track, I don't know. But uh, I don't know where those all are. But at the same time, think about that. If we, just, if we, if we saw what Jesus did, he'll do that same thing today. And like somebody said, if we'll find the miracles Jesus did, he's, he, he never changes. He'll always do what he's always done. And, but if we just read through the miracles of Jesus' ministry, find what people did, if we'll do what they did, we'll get what they got because God's no respecter of persons. Okay? Now, I, you know, as a general rule, you know, you understand this. In the body of Christ, you got people, they're, you know, they're living where the glass is always half empty. And they want to tell you everybody they know that didn't get a miracle. Well, you know, I've never seen people buy tickets and spend money to go to a seminar on how to fail in life. Right. Right. <laughs> I'm going to a seminar. I can get in this thing for $1,500, and I get all the books and the tapes. I get everything to go, what's the seminar on? Someone's going to teach me how to fail. Well, nobody's going to go to that. Nobody in normal. 
But see, in the body of Christ, you know, you start talking about healing and everybody wants to give you a dozen cases where it didn't work. I know there are cases where it didn't work. I know God didn't fail. God didn't change. Jesus didn't change. Okay, I understand all that. But what I'd rather do is I'd rather find where it did work and follow that example and find where it didn't work and follow that example. Okay, well, there are the cases where it didn't work. Yeah, but God didn't change. He didn't fail. Somehow, you know, I... God wants everybody saved, but I don't follow after people that didn't get saved. So I want to follow where it, does, where it did work. Okay? So, yeah, there are folks that didn't get saved, but it's not God's fault. Sure, there are people that didn't get healed. It's not God's fault. In fact, the Bible's pretty plain about it. The curse causeless shall not come. There's always a cause somewhere. Now, we haven't got time to get into that. We'd be here till next Christmas. But where you, you go through, you'll find there's always a cause somewhere. There's always an open door. If there's a skunk in your house, there's an open door somewhere. Amen. And if you throw it out, get fumigated, and you come in a week later and it's still sitting back there by the fireplace, there's probably an open door somewhere. If the skunk keeps coming back in, there's an open door. There's a crack somewhere. Last day. May, June, whenever it was when we started launch, we, we got ready to, to start over here in the, in the youth building, and we went in there, and there were a skunk in there. <laughs> who did find that? Was that Ant? I don't know who found it. Somebody found the skunk. It had gotten in a wall, crawled up in there, and died. You can tell it died. But, see, thing, but somehow that thing had to get in somewhere. But, we're, we're way out in the... The Bible says Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse. I am the redeemed of the Lord. You are, if you're born again, you are the redeemed of the Lord. Redeemed from what? Redeemed from, from, from uh, spiritual death, ter- eternal separation from God. Redeemed from poverty. Redeemed from every sickness and every disease known to mankind. Redeemed from the coronavirus. I got redeemed from that 2,000 years ago. Deuteronomy 28, 61 said, Every sickness and disease not written in this book of the law is contained in the curse of the law. Galatians 3, 13 said, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Jesus redeemed us from coronavirus 2,000 years ago. It has, it has no right to come near our dwelling. We are the redeemed of the Lord. We are the redeemed of the Lord. So in other words, I am redeemed from three main things. Spiritual death, eternal separation from God. I am redeemed from every... Every sickness and disease known to mankind, I'm redeemed from the ones that weren't known to mankind. I got redeemed from the N1H1 or H1N1. I got redeemed from bird flu, swine flu, pig flu, chicken flu, anything that flew. I got redeemed from all that when Jesus went to the cross. I am, I am, I am the redeemed of the Lord. That stuff has no right to come near my dwelling. Yeah, but what if it comes knocking on my door? Open the door up and say, you got the wrong place. Amen. It, might, it might belong to one of those neighbors down there. I hope not. But I'm telling you one thing. It doesn't belong in my household. You might as well pack your bags, take your symptoms, and get out of here. Because it does not belong in this house. The blood of Jesus is on my doorpost. <laughs> Hallelujah. We've been in Europe, and I've been watching people walking around with masks on their face for the last week. Everybody wearing masks everywhere. Hallelujah. I don't have a mask over my mouth. I got the word coming out of my mouth. Now, don't misunderstand me. Don't say, Pastor Mark said, the masks are wrong. That's just not bad. You just don't believe you're wearing a mask. That's not what I said. What would you say? Get the tape. Well, whatever we got. Download. Whatever. I've got to get back to my subject. I'm starting somewhere in here. Where was I? Now, Mark 4. Thank you. That's right. Mark 4. Now, doing the works of Jesus. We can't do them if we don't know what they are. Now, you're not going to know all the works of Jesus. Did you ever stop and think about it? Um, Jesus, there were times he healed as, as many as touched him were made whole. For they went virtue out of him and healed them all. Um, I mean, you notice Jesus, he didn't get everybody healed because not everybody would get healed. How do you know that? Mark 6, 5, Jesus went to his own hometown, and the Bible says there he 
could do, not would not do, didn't say wouldn't, say it couldn't, <clears throat> excuse me, there he could do no mighty work, save he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them and marveled because of their unbelief and went around about their cities and villages teaching. Jesus went to his own hometown, couldn't get everybody healed. I've had people say, well, I'll tell you, if, you, if God's in the healing business, then you need to go clear out all the hospitals because if, God, if God's a healer, then, then you ought to be able to clean the place out. Well, if Jesus couldn't clean them out, I couldn't clean them out. Amen. Well, how do you know Jesus couldn't clean them out? I was hoping you'd ask. Amen. If you go over there uh, in, uh, where Jesus went to the uh, pool of Bethesda, okay, and there was a man that had been there 38 years. Jesus walked up to the man and said, is it your will to be healed? He said, I can't. He said, well, get up and walk anyway. And he got up and walked away. Jesus disappeared into the crowd, a multitude being in that place. Here's a great multitude of people in an ancient hospital, the pool of Bethesda. Jesus gets one man healed and walks away and disappears in the crowd. He didn't clean the place out. If he didn't, you're not going to. Now, there may be moves when you might see a whole wing cleaned out before Jesus comes back. I'd love, to see, I'd love to see somebody go through the children's wing at the cancer hospital and just clean the whole place out. I'd love to see that. Would I be shocked and surprised? Not a bit. But the bottom line is we're not going to go beyond the master. We ought to do what he did, but we're not going to go beyond him as far as uh, uh, if he wasn't cleaning out hospitals, every hospital, healing every sick person, you're not going to get every sick person healed. But I'll tell you, we ought to get a whole lot more healed than what we're getting right now. So anyway, doing the works of Jesus, he went about teaching, preaching, healing. If I'm going to do the works of Jesus, that means I need to do at least two of those. Uh, the healing's great, but there's no use doing the healing if I'm not going to do some teaching and preaching along with it. See, I've got to get God, I've got to give him something to confirm. The Lord, they went everywhere preaching the word, Mark 16. They went everywhere preaching the, the word, the Lord working together with them, confirming their opinions with signs following. Confirming their church traditions with signs following. No, they went everywhere preaching the word, the Lord working together with them, confirming the word with signs following. So anyway, now we're talking about doing the works of Jesus. And, and uh, um, you know, we've got, we've got four gospels that show us the works of Jesus. And we've been working on that for 2,000 years now. And we haven't even scratched the surface. So we're probably not going to get through all this in between now and the rapture of the church. But yet to go back through... Uh, fourth chapter of Mark's gospel. Um, I, I actually, I want, what I want to get to is the fifth chapter, but I got a sneaking suspicion we're not going to make it tonight. It says here, verse 35, um, if we went back here to the, to the first part of the fourth chapter, when Jesus is talking about the parable of the sower and the seed, um, this is amazing. We'll, we'll get back around to this some other time. But Jesus was teaching on the parable of the sower and the seed. You get hold of what Jesus is saying in here, it'll change our lives. Okay, It'll show you how to get the word working for you. But anyway, that's another night. Now verse 35, so he's just finished that and talks about how he spoke to them in parables in verse 34. And the thirst, verse 35 says, In the same day when the evening was come, he said to them, now notice you might want to underline that. You might want to underline it. It says, when the even was come, he said to them, he what? He what? He what? He what? I'll make sure you got it. When the even was come, uh, he said to them, let us pass over. Let what? Do you notice he didn't say, let me go over. He didn't say, I'm going over. He's with his disciples and he said, let us go over to the other side. Man, that's set in concrete right there. It's forever settled in heaven. The master said that. The, when the evening was come, now he's just talked about the power of sowing the seed. He's just talked the power, about, about the power of hearing the word. He's just talked about the power of sowing the seed of the word of God and watching the harvest come up. Now he's going to demonstrate it to them, and they didn't get it. Now, and we, I, we all would have got it, I'm sure. <laughs> But he said, when the evening was come, he said to them, let us go to the other side. Now, you might want to underline that because we'll I think we'll get back to it tonight. Um, and, and when uh, he had sent, them, sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. He was already there teaching from the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. So in other words, he's in a bigger boat. There's smaller ones with him. So apparently, it looks to me like he's got this boat that's got all of his disciples in. It must be a, a good-sized boat going across the sea here. He's got some other smaller ones going along with him. It says, verse 37, that's interesting. See, he's, he, he said, well, he, was he in the will of God? Well, I think he was. 
how, he must have been in the will of God because he was the will of God. How could the will of God not be in the will of God? You're just looking at me funny now. Jesus was the will of God in action. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Okay, so the will of God is there. And he says, let us go to the, to the other side. And when they sent all the people away, they took him into the ship and they were on the, and uh, there were other little ones, other ships there with them. Verse 37 said, and there rose a what? Great storm of wind. Well, well, surely that wouldn't have come up if he's in the will of God. You, get, you, you think just because you're in the will of God, you think just because you're in the will of God, everything's ought to be just going just smooth, you know, just smooth roads, you know, and no bumps and no chuck holes, no Tulsa streets, you know. You think, you think you, just because you're in the will of God, everything, and, or maybe you think if the going gets tough, you must not be in the will of God. If, if, going, if tough going means you're out of the will of God, the Apostle Paul was never in the will of God one day in his entire life and ministry. Well, if it's the will of God, the doors are always open. Doors weren't always open for Paul. He usually had to go kick them and open. And when he got to the other side, they beat him, stoned him, and shipwrecked him, and put him in prison. See, we get this impression that if it's the will of God, it's always going to be smooth. If it's not smooth, it's probably not the will of God. But isn't this interesting? Jesus got all of his disciples in the boat. He said, let us go to the other side. And on the way over there, they're, they're, he's, that's where I started to get to a little while ago. Jesus got so many miracles there were times everybody got healed. Do you ever stop thinking about why did Jesus always get all these results, get all these miracles? Well, well, it's because he was the son of God. Well, yeah, that's a great answer. But if he got all those he results because he was the son of God, then who are you? Okay. Haven't we been made to become the sons of God? His spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are the sons of God. Children of God, if children, heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. If Jesus got all these results just because he was the son of God, then you and I ought to be getting the same results because he's made us to be sons of God. Okay? All right? I, I, I want you to think about something here. Jesus didn't get results just because he had the name of Jesus. He did, but he gave that name to us. He didn't get all the results he got just because he was the son of God, because if that was the case, you and I should always be getting as many results as he got. Because not only was he the son of God, but he made us sons. He brought us into the family. Why did Jesus get the results he got? He said, I only do what I see my father do. Yeah. Yeah. The reason Jesus got, I, you know, I, I let chew on this one for a while. The reason Jesus got the results he got was because he always followed the Holy Ghost. Okay? What do you mean by that? Remember back there, uh, uh, the, uh, Mark chapter 1? Uh, verse 40, a leper came to him, fell down before him, beseeching him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him. You're not supposed to get that, that close to a healthy person. Jesus, this man was close enough to Jesus for Jesus to reach out and touch him. He reached out and touched him and said, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him. He's cleansed. So here's a leper. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. Now, if he did like most Christians, he'd say, okay, now I know how to get every leper healed. You get arms reached, you put your hands, and you say, I will be thou clean. Now that we'd get into a leper healing uh, uh, format. We'd make, yeah, we'd make a church doctrine out of it. This is the way. You know, Jesus spit on somebody, got him healed. Well, now I know how, you, I know how to get people healed. You just go spit on everybody. That's what Jesus did. But if you, isn't it interesting that Jesus, to get one leper healed, Jesus put his hands on him and, and answered a question and said, Be thou clean, man was clean. Another place, remember the ten lepers that came to Jesus and they cried from afar off? Jesus said, go, didn't, He didn't go lay hands on them. He just said, Go show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were healed. Isn't it interesting? He didn't have a format for healing lepers. He had a format for always following the Holy Ghost. But what about blind people? Two blind men followed him into the house, crying, Master, have mercy on us. He said, you believe I'm able to do this? They said, yes, Lord. He said, put his hands on him, said, according to your faith, so be it done unto you. Instantly, their eyes were open. Okay? But then you get over in John, the ninth chapter. As, uh, as they passed by, there was a man blind from birth. Jesus' disciples said, Master, who did sin? This man or his parents said he's born blind. And Jesus said, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it's still day. The night comes when no man can work. Then when he had thus, King James, when he had thus spoken, 
He spat on the dirt, made clay of the spittle, anointed the man's eyes, and said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. See, now, if, we, if one of us had that happen today, we'd have a dip in the pool of Siloam meeting, and you'd have to go to the Middle East. You'd have to go to Israel somewhere and, to get, and get in the pond over there to get healed. But see, what, two blind men come, he lays hands on. Another blind man, he puts mud in his eyes. Okay? Another blind man over in Mark's gospel. Mark, the uh, eighth chapter. Over there, Jesus, they bring a blind man to him. Jesus spits on his eyes. Says, look up. He looked up. He said, I see him in his trees walking. He lays his hands on him again, administers more anointing. He says, look up again. The man looked up. He saw every man clearly. You got three cases of blind people, but every one of them, Jesus operated differently. Spit on one, put mud in another one's eyes, laid hands on the other ones. What did he do? Every time he got people healed is because he followed the leading of the Holy Ghost. Ooh, I'll tell you what. Do you know if we'd learned to follow the leading of the Holy Ghost, we'd be getting a lot better results than we're getting today. He said, I only do what I see my father do. Everything I do pleases my father. See, he's, well, how did he do that? He spent so much time praying and waiting on God that when he got to where he needed to do something, he already had his antennas up, spiritually sensitive. No, we haven't got time to go that direction. But anyway, anyway, where are we? Verse 37 said, there arose a great storm of wind and the waves beat into the ship so it was now full. So the waves are coming over the top. The, the boat's filling up. Okay? Uh, and, and again, sometimes you have to just clarify this. That, um, uh, that wind didn't come up to teach Jesus something. I know this is here for my good. What good's it going to do? Sink the boat? No. This is here for my good. This is here to teach me. This is, this is God's method. This is, this is helping me. Well, how's it helping you other than getting you wet? Didn't say God sent this. In fact, I will prove that God didn't send that. You want proof? No? Two yeses. I'm going to give it to you anyway. Because when, when we'll get there in a minute, but when they, when, when they woke Jesus up and he got up, and what did he do? He, I better read it to you so you can see this. What did they do? Mm, verse 39. And he arose and he what? What did he do? Rebuked. He rebuked the wind and he said to the sea, peace be still. Jesus rebuked the storm. If God was in the storm, Jesus couldn't have rebuked it. See, the 12th chapter of the book of Matthew said, any house divided against itself will not stand. If the devil comes after casting out the devil, then the devil's kingdom won't stand. In other words, if God sent the storm, Jesus could not have rebuked it because Jesus is not going to rebuke the Father. Nope. Proves right there. That didn't come from heaven. That's not God teaching him. That's not God perfecting. It's not God trying to help him. It's not God help, he, you know, working, healing his emotions and healing his innards. And it's not, that's not God doing all this stuff. It's the, it's, he's in the will of God, and the, the devil's out trying to kill him. Right? Yep. He's in the middle of a sea, and the devil's out to kill him. But now, isn't it interesting? This is going too fast. Now, <laughs> verse 35, back up. Same day when the even has come, he, he what? He said. said to them, let us pass over to the other side. And when they sent them away, the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with them other little ships. And there rose a great storm of wind. And the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, fasting and praying and in deep intercession and travail. And <laughs> You know, sometimes we need to be real. We, we, sometimes we just need to get real with ourselves and think that the whole weight of the kingdom of God does not rest on our shoulders. Oh, yeah. Don't take yourself so seriously. Now, now. Now, you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes we think it all hinges on me. Well, if me doesn't do something, God's got 100,000 more me's that'll step up to the plate. When Judas fell by transgression, God just drew straws and pulled out another guy, put Matthias in place. Somebody doesn't obey, he's got another one. I don't know, but somebody said that someone asked one time, ask Sister Catherine Kuhlman, how did God choose you? Well, she's, now again, I wasn't there. If this is wrong, forgive me. It's just what I heard. But somebody said to Catherine Kuhlman, why did God chose you? Well, she said, well, he didn't really choose me. She said he asked seven other men to do it, and they didn't obey, so he picked me. Is that what she said? Is that, did I get that right? 
How do you know? <laughs> I couldn't resist that one. But is that, is that pretty correct? Yeah. Yeah. See, we, I, I love the fact that if I decide not to obey God, the whole kingdom of God is not going to fall apart. Because if, if, if plan A doesn't work, God goes to plan A. You are never going to be plan B, C, D, or E. If plan A doesn't go, if plan A decides not to obey God, he just pulls another plan A. And if they don't obey God, he pulls another plan A. And if they don't obey God, uh, uh, you are never a cheap substitute. How many people did God ask to go pray in Europe? I don't know, but I'm just glad he got to me. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> If this is kind of going all over the place, blame it on jet lag. Anyway, <laughs> and, there, and there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so it was now full, and he was in the hinder part of the ship, a what? Asleep on the pillow. Now think about that. He's, he's, there's a storm that's so bad, it's filling the boat up, and he's back there asleep on the pillow. That's what you call entering into rest. They that believe do enter into rest. When you, while you're still laboring, you ain't got into faith yet. He that believes enters into rest. If you haven't entered into rest, keep working on your believers. So, pump so much word down on the inside that you can't help but believe God. And once you step out of works over into faith, once you step into faith, you quit working. You step into a place called faith and it doesn't matter how many storms are going on around you. You just lean back in the pillow and you sleep like a log. I started to say sleep like a baby, but I hear they wake up all the time. And that's... <laughs> so anyway... He was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. This isn't even the, the miracle we're trying to get to. We're just leading up to it. He was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on the pillow. Now, isn't it interesting? He wasn't laboring over this. He wasn't concerned about it. Do you know why he wasn't concerned about it? Verse 35, he said. He said. When you get to where you understand how faith works and you pull right out of the innermost part of your being, you don't just rattle some things out of your head, but you reach way down on the inside and you said, you saith, you saith, <laughs> you saith, let's go to the other side. You saith, it's going to be a great year. You saith, sickness won't come near my dwelling. You saith, windfalls attacking my being. You saith. You saith, poverty's not coming near me. You saith, I get, when nobody else gets raises, I get raises. When nobody else gets benefits, I get benefits. You saith, you saith, I'm walking in health all the days of my life. I'll run my race with patience and I'll finish my course with joy. With long life, he'll satisfy me and he'll show me his salvation. I saith, I saith, that's I saith, I saith it. Do you know why Jesus could go to sleep in the middle of a storm? Because he said, let, let us, I tell you, when in the middle of a storm, you find one person in faith and then just rally everybody around him. The world's looking for somebody that's got some answers. And when you get that working for you, you people will rattle around you and the, and, and, and the blessings will just spill over on them. He said it. That's why he could go to sleep when the boat's filling up. Now notice, the disciples, these are his chosen few. And they awake him. They woke him up. I would like, I, I'd like that kind of faith working in me where, where the wind's blowing, the waves are beating on the boat, the boat's filling up with water, the boat's rocking in the middle of the, of the storm. I'm drenched, I'm soaked, I'm laying on a pillow, sound, I'm so asleep that my friend's got to come shake me and wake me up. <laughs> and so, so it says, and he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they, they awake him, and they said to him, Master, don't you care that we're perishing? Those are the disciples you want hanging around you. <laughs> Wake you out of a sound sleep, partway to your destination, where you're going to go out there, and you're on your way to cast a devil out of a guy, 
you're, 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 you've entered into rest, and all of a sudden, your friends are shaking you, going, aren't you, don't you care? We're dying. You were, we're, we're dying. You're, we're, gonna, we're perishing. We're going to die out here. So Jesus, he rose, and he rebuked the wind, which couldn't have been God, because if it was God, he couldn't rebuke it. He rose and re- God gets blamed for so much. And he said to the sea, peace be still. Well, is he rebuking God? Is he telling God to be still? God doesn't produce storms. God still storms. A lot of stuff God gets blamed for, he's not doing. Well, I'll tell you, God, you know, God, God's just sent a giant into my life because he knows I need that. No, God sent the word into your life because he knows you need that. God sent the Holy Ghost into your life because if you mix the word and the Holy Ghost together, devils and giants are not going to want to hang around you very long. Where was I? And he said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. And he said to them, now I love this. And he said to them, them, he said to them, why are you so fearful? How do you know they were fearful? Well, they just shook him and said, we're dying, we're dying, we're dying. He knew they were in fear. (laughs) Pretty obvious. He said to them, why are you so fearful? And he said, why are you so fearful? And how is it that you have no faith? Now, you know, for years I thought what he said that, that he meant, why didn't you still the storm? Why didn't you calm the storm? Why did you wake me up to still the storm? That wasn't what he was saying. What was he trying to tell them? He said, how is it you have no faith? Why did you wake me up? He wasn't rebuking them for not stilling the storm. He was rebuking them for not believing his word. He said, let's go to the other side. They should have been asleep right back there with him. In the middle of the storm, drenched with the water, they should have been right back there sleeping, you know, pillows right there. They, all, they should all have been wrapped up there sleeping like babies. But they won't because they, they got over into fear because of the situation instead of faith because he wasn't rebuking them because they didn't still the storm. The storm shouldn't have had to be stilled. If they'd have believed what he said, it received what he said, they'd have got what he said, and they'd have gone to the other side no matter what the storm did. See, what God's looking for is a, a people, not that it just still storms, but he's looking for some people that don't care what the weather's doing. They don't care what the economy's doing. They don't care what the swine flu's doing. They don't care what... What's that, what's that disease? What's that? Coronavirus. He's looking for some folks who don't care what all that is. Why? Because it not, it's not coming near my dwelling because he said in his word, no weapon formed against me can prosper. He said in his word, my God supplies all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And what he's trying to do is get it where not only would, he, would they believe his word, but they, he was trying to get them to the place that they'd say it and believe that they'd get what they said. Because that's the God kind of faith, Mark 11, chapter, right around verse 22. That's the kind of faith God put on the inside of us, not just that we would believe only what God said, but when we put it in our lips, we can believe what we say will come to pass. So anyway, and he said, why are you so faithful? How is it you have no faith? No faith is not not uh, still in the storm. No faith is not believing what Jesus said will come to pass. He stilled the storm just to be able to get their attention. But then he wanted to teach them, don't be, don't be moved by this storm. Storm, Storms are going to come. God didn't do them. He didn't send them. He didn't commission them. He didn't allow them. He didn't permit them. He didn't divinely design them for your life. God has nothing to do with the storms of life. If he did, Jesus couldn't have rebuked them. What he's trying to say is don't be moved by the stuff that comes along. Stuff's going to come physically, mentally, emotionally, financially. Physically, stuff's going to come. Don't let the stuff move you. Move the stuff. You know? It's going to come. So anyway, well, let's move along. Where are we at? First chapter, let's go to chapter 5. We've got a little bit of time left. We won't go much further. It said, now notice, verse, uh, underline this part. And they, they came over to the other side. Uh, we're, we're going all over creation here tonight. I can see that. <laughs> That's all right. It says here in chapter 5, verse 1, and they came over to the other side of the sea. Okay? They were going to go there anyway. Jesus said they're going over. They just could have done it without fear if they'd listened to him. 
But says they came over to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And, uh, oh, I wish we had weeks to just get on this. When he's come out of the ship immediately, there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Who had his dwelling place among the tombs. No man could bind him. No, not with chains. Because that he had often been bound with fetters and chains. And the chains had been plucked asunder by him. The fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs. Crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Isn't it interesting? A man, with he was possessed with the devil and had a legion. He wasn't possessed with a legion. He was, possessed, one, he was possessed by one devil, and that one devil had a legion that came and cooperated with him. This guy had over 2,000 demons in his life. I've seen people with a number of devils, but I've never seen anybody that I would think had 2,000 demons. How do you know he had 2,000? Because there were about 2,000 swine. When Jesus gave them leave, they all went into the swine, and they ran off the cliff into the, and drowned themselves. So here, this guy's in bad shape. But isn't it interesting, a man that's possessed with the devil, influenced by a legion, Possessed with one, influenced by 2,000, that guy, is in, he is a bad case. But when Jesus walked up, isn't it very, it's so interesting. I haven't got all the light on this that I want to have, but I'm going to get more. Isn't it interesting when a man with a demon and uh, possessed, not just depressed, you know, most what we call possessed back in the days when they were casting devils into fried chicken buckets and all that stuff. If you missed that, you can count yourself blessed. But anyway, you know, when all that's going on, you know, I mean, anyway, um, here's this, this man is, he, he's, he's, they can't, nobody can tame him. He's, they put chains on him. He breaks them. Supernatural strength. They can't keep the man down. This guy is, he's in the tombs crying and cutting himself. The man is totally, totally insane. Today they'd have him in an institution. They'd have him so medicated he couldn't move. Okay. But here this guy is, and isn't it interesting, here's a guy that has no control over his life. People try to calm him down, they try to stop him, they try to chain him, can't do any of this. But when Jesus shows up, there's the human will is such a strong force. When Jesus shows up, that man ran and fell down before Jesus. and Those devils weren't worshiping him. Isn't it interesting that when it came down to it, when Jesus showed up, 2,001 devils could not stop that man from going to get help. I believe there's a force in the human will. I believe there's a force in the human will that says, I want to be free. I want to be free. If a person wants to be free, there aren't, uh, all the devils in hell can't stop them from being free. <clears throat> I'm convinced of that. I am so convinced of that. I know of a case, a person I went to high school with, messed up. Oh, person messed up. Uh, substance abuse, everything you can think of. But I tell you what, somebody took the gospel to them and, I, and instantly... Instantly, every devil left their life. Instantly, they are born again. Instantly, they made Jesus Lord of their life. Instantly changed. Threw away their booze. Threw away the drugs. Threw away the cigarettes. Threw everything, threw, threw everything away. Instantly, never did go back to it. Instantly, here's a person so demonized that nobody could help them. Not as crazy as this person. But so demonized. But when somebody brought the gospel, all the devils in hell couldn't stop this person from being born again. The power of the human will. When people get to where they want to be free, they will be free. You just got to get the want to kicked into high gear. So anyway, um, but the part, let's, let's keep moving here. Verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 1 says, And they came over into the other side of the sea. Now, we're not going to go into all this. Um, but um, you see this whole situation where they, they uh, Jesus cast the devil out of this guy, cast the devils out. Um, Verse 13, Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out, entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. And there were about 2,000, and they were choked in the sea. And they, they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done, and they came to Jesus to see him that was possessed with the devil, and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. They were afraid. Isn't that amazing? When they saw the guy normal, they were afraid. They were afraid when he had 2,000 demons and he was running around there, you know, crying and cutting himself and screaming. And they weren't afraid of him then. When he got set free, they were afraid of him. I had a lot of folks who were, they liked me the way I was before I met Jesus. Afterward, they, they would not come near me. I went to my first class reunion and all my friends, they, they wouldn't come near me. Right, wasn't it? They had to go out in the parking lot and get high. 
Then they came back, and then they're really brave. But I'll tell you what, they, were, they weren't afraid of me back in the old life, but I'll tell you, when I got Jesus in me, they got afraid. But anyway, um, there, there's part I'm looking for here. Okay, verse 21. After this man is set free, uh, isn't it interesting? Verse 21 says, and when uh, Jesus was passed over again by ship to the other side. I saw this a number of years ago. I was looking at this, and, and uh, I, I, this is when I got a real insight into the fact that money doesn't bother God. Okay, now he doesn't want you to be ridiculous. Don't misunderstand me. But money doesn't bother. What am I saying? What I'm saying is Jesus, now if you back up, remember chapter 5, verse, I think it was verse 1, and they came over unto the other side of the sea. Jesus took his whole staff. Now staff, we don't need all the church staff to think about it this way. But Jesus took his whole staff, put him in the big boat, and took him across the sea. All, all at one time, he, did, he, he took his whole staff on an overseas trip, I'm getting way too much joy out of that one. Jesus took his whole staff. We know there are 12 of them. He took his whole staff, put him on the boat, took him on an overseas trip, took over there and cast the devil out of one man, get back in the boat, and come right back over. Jesus spent whatever he needed to spend, he would spend it. He didn't say, well, I don't know if it's worth it because I'm not sure how many people we're going to have in the meeting. He didn't say, I'm not, take, I'm, not, I'm not taking a boat over there. We might, not, we might not have a thousand people show up at the service. We might not have the stadium filled with people. We might just find one old crazy up demon-possessed guy and get one. Isn't it interesting? Jesus invested money to take his whole staff to go over and get one man set free and then came back over. And I, what I'm saying is God dealt with me a long time ago. And it, it, I, You know, you wouldn't know this, but I'm kind of a cheapskate. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> you can ask my sister. I was the family banker. Anytime they needed to pay the paper boy, they'd come see me. I was the one. I've had people say, oh, I've, got, I've had people used to accuse me of having my mattresses stuffed with money. I just started agreeing with them. I used to have friends say, ah, oh, he's got so much money, he's got his mattresses stuff. Well, I didn't, but I started agreeing with him. I got some, well, anyway, <laughs> I don't, by the way. But, but, you know, so God had to really work me over at times to realize that he's more invested in, he's more interested in souls than he is dollars. He'll invent, he'll, he will, he, Jesus would have come and redeemed one person. If there was only one on earth, Jesus would have come and paid the price to redeem. He'd have paid the price to die for one person if there's only one. If Jesus would have died for one, then God will spend anything to reach one. God had to really work me over a long time ago where I wasn't thinking the numbers thing. Well, is it worth it for the numbers? It's only going to be this, only going to be that. God's not concerned about the numbers. He's concerned about what am I telling you to do? Because God, God would invest an overseas trip into the whole staff of Jesus to go cast the devil out of one man. But if you'll notice, got that one man saved, and he went and started preaching that everywhere he went. Turned him into an evangelist. But anyway... I got to get stopped here. We've gone long enough. But um, next week we'll get to where we're headed with this. <laughs> but the part I was wanting us to get to is Jesus passed over, took the whole staff, went over, and in verse 21 says, When Jesus passed over again, all he did was go over there, cast the devil out of a guy, and turn around and come back in. God will invest anything in one. If you're the only one lost, if you're the only person on earth, if you're the only person on your way to hell, Jesus would have paid any price to reach you. Okay? And, and, and I know sometimes we, we think about missions and, and we think, well, this one's getting thousands and this one's getting millions and this one's getting tens of millions. Well, what about the guy that's going over there and just one at a time? What if somebody's on the streets over there getting Muslims born again and teaching them, telling them about Jesus? It's God's, God's, he doesn't, he's not bothered by the numbers, and so he's therefore he's not bothered by the dollars. Yeah, I tell you, he'll, he'll invest anything to reach people if we're willing to spend it to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Well, i got to get stopped here. I have no idea where we've been, so I don't know where we're going. 
Oh, we get, we're coming to verse 22. We're coming up to Jairus. We'll start there next week. We've, we've gone long enough. Jairus ruled of the synagogue. Now we're getting to some more of the, 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 the works of Jesus. There was Jairus, ruler of the synagogue. His daughter was, he came up there. He said, my little, daughter, my little girl's at the point of death. Come, come lay your hands on her. She'll live and be healed. But if you notice, what did he do? He said it. He said it. He said it. I'll tell you, as we get hold of that, of the power of our words. Jesus said, we're going to the other side. He went back, went to sleep. When you get to where you understand the power of your words, coming out of a heart of faith, you know, when you say it, you can, render, you can enter into rest. You can go sleep in the back part of the thing with storms going on and your finances going crazy and, and flu bugs going around and everything else. You can go back and go to sleep because you've entered into rest. He that believes enters into rest. Let's stand to our feet. Father, we thank you in the wonderful name of Jesus. Oh, great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is he. Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, dear Lord. Oh, what you, uh, what you, what you will do to reach one person. Lord, I look back. I look back and think what you did to reach me. Wow. I look back and think what you did. You, you, you took a guy that from a whole different part of the campus, middle of the t semester, somehow the only person I knew at the time that I would listen to, and I didn't think I'd listen to him. But you took a guy and you moved him clear across the campus, put him into my dorm, and had me come face to face with him day after day in the hallway until he came up and said, you need to go to a meeting. And got me to go to the meeting where I met Jesus. What you'll do to reach one. You'll invest anything to reach the one. And we're thankful. I I'm grateful, Father. I'm so thankful that you didn't wonder if it was worth it. You didn't wonder if it was worth it to, to, to upend somebody and move him clear across campus. Be forever, ever eternally grateful. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So thank you so much, Father. May we get that on the inside of us. If we'll just go out after the one. Well, it's not that big a deal if I only reach one. Oh, no, it's that big a deal. Jesus would have died for one. He'll spend anything to reach one. We thank you for it, dear Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Glory to God. Thank you. Though the, the, the storms and the winds of adversity may blow, we can just crawl in the back of the boat and go to sleep because we say, we say, no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. Since God before me, who can be against me? Thanks be unto God who always gives me the victory through my Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be unto God who always causes me to triumph in Christ Jesus. Father, I'm just so grateful and so thankful. I say it. I say it. Jesus said it and got it. I'll say it and get it. Thank you, dear Lord. Coronavirus not coming near our dwellings. Thank you, dear Father. Poverty is not coming near our dwellings. Thank you, dear Father. Uh, emotional distress. Oh, and, and the attacks on the mind. They're not coming near our dwellings. Thank you. Oh, our soul has been saved through the knowledge of the Word of God. Thank you. Hallelujah. Receive with meekness the engrafted Word, which is able to save your souls. Thank you, dear Father. No matter what comes along, no matter what comes along, we get what we believe, we get what we say. Hallelujah. We're, we're thankful for it, dear Father. And our heart cries, Lord, teach us. Teach us how to do the works you did. The world's lost out there. The world's lost out there. The world's lost out there. Somebody, somebody cared enough to tell us. May we care enough to tell somebody else. And we thank you for it in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We ought to lift our hands and thank God. Glory.
folks who wouldn't know it. You, you got so good at covering it up. What you'd call the faith walk. But your mind's been tormented. Your mind has been tormented. When you're asleep at night, you wake up, your mind's been tormented. When you're off by yourself, your mind's been tormented. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I take authority over that thing. I break the power of that over your mind. I loose you and I let you go and I command you to go free from that. No more, no more, no more. And if it tries to come back, you need to say, no more, no more, no more. Not because Pastor Mark said it, but because I said it. And you'll have what you say. Oh my, there's somebody here. Your heart's been just going bonkers. Your heart has been from racing to almost not beating at all. It doesn't just pound at times. It just goes from racing to you wonder if the thing's going to stop. And it, sometimes it seems like it has. It's gone up and down and back and forth. And, and, and uh, I don't have to pray for you. Power of God's coming on you right now. Whatever that is, whoever you are, in the name of Jesus, if I was you, I'd put my hand on my chest and say, I take that right now in Jesus' name. I am free in the name of Jesus Christ. And then there's the same thing with blood pressure. It's another person. It's another person. Your blood pressure's been going up and down and up and down and up and down and, and, and you've been watching it. You've been, you've been putting one of those cuffs on and you've been watching it and it, it, it almost scares you because it skyrockets one minute and then it tanks the next and, and, you, and you've been chasing that and chasing that and chasing that. Well, in the name of Jesus, I speak to the very source of that problem. I command you to be free in the name. Free in the name. Free in the name. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, now there's healings going on everywhere, all over here. If you need something, just reach your hands up, take it. I take my healing. I take my healing. I say I got it. I say I've got it. I say I've got it. I say I've got it. I got it. I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. it. It's mine. It's mine. It's mine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. And there shall come a wave of divine healing to America again. As surely as there was many years back, there's another one coming in the very near future. Another wave of divine healing. Healings and miracles. Signs and wonders. Demonstrations of the Holy Ghost. Bodies healed of all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. There will be those that medical science would say, we can't figure it out. We don't know what to do about it. There's nothing we can do. We can't find the source of it. In the name of Jesus will be administered and every symptom will disappear like a snowball in the hot August sun. And there's healings that will take place. Oh, my, my. Oh, it'll sweep through the church, but that's just the beginning. It'll sweep through the church, but then the church will take it to the world. And there will be divine healings that will go into the world of false religions. <laughs> there will be healings and miracles that will go into the world of false religions. Religions where many have said they can't be reached. They're not hungry. Oh, but the demonstration of the Holy Ghost will flow and the dinner bell of healing will ring and oh, into the kingdom, many of false religions will flow. So you can just watch and pray, which is what we can do today, but you watch in the, in the days, weeks, months, and even years to come, church going to rise up and in the supernatural going to run. Oh yeah, living in a day when the Holy Ghost has been closeted and locked away for the sake of numbers. But all oh, the days coming when the church will grow and increase in numbers because of the freedom of the Holy Ghost to demonstrate and manifest. He will, he will come out of that. He will come out of that place he's been locked up in. He will come out of that place where he's been shut into. And the Spirit of God will flow. He will take charge of the church again. And the power of heaven, the church will come to know. The powers of the world to come will flow through the body of Christ. And oh, the things we've heard about before we'll experience through our own lives. So there's nothing left to do but pray, rejoice, and be glad because we're moving into some things we never before have seen or had. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I heard one time, don't know, I've got a friend that was there. I could probably get the details from him. One time, Dr. Lester Summerall was doing a meeting, I think up in the, I think up in the Northwest somewhere. 
And he prophesied, said, the day's going to come when God's going to bring his missionaries back from the four corners of the globe to bring a move of God back to America. Yeah. Hallelujah. So when these missionaries start coming in, spend a little more time back here. Bless them. Be kind to them. God's going to have some folks pick some things up in some other lands, like a log off a fire, bring it back here, and going to light our nation on fire again. Hallelujah. Well, let's give them a shout of thanks. out there there's a nervous condition i don't know what it is but there's a nervous condition a nerve you'd call it a nervous condition i don't know what medical science would a nervous condition oh my my it's just it's a it's torturing you power of god's coming in that right now in the name of jesus in the in the next five days you're going to see a major difference you will see a major difference now it won't, will it all be gone in five? no 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 but you'll see a major difference and you just believe your way out until it's all gone Hallelujah. My, my. Healing's taking place everywhere. My goodness. Oh, hallelujah. Ooh, thank you, Jesus. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care if they don't know what it is. I don't care if they don't know what it is. They don't have to know what it is. They're not doing the healing. Don't care if the doctors can't figure it out. I don't care if the nurses can't figure it out. I, can't, I don't care if medical science can't figure it out. I don't care you that's been dealing with that and it, it's got you so scared because nobody can figure out what it is I'm telling you right now all you need to know is it's the devil and Jesus whipped him all you need to know is Jesus conquered that and he healed you 2,000 years ago stop worrying about what is going on and start rejoicing for what you know belongs to you rejoice and be glad shout the victory hallelujah glory 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 well let's give him thanks again hallelujah glory glory <laughs> Hallelujah. Woo! Yeah. Shoot. My, my, my. Spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. Powers of the age to come. Spiritual gifts. Hallelujah. Spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. Start out like a trickle. End up like a stream. Oh. Turn into a flood. Then it'd be like living in a dream. Hallelujah. Glory! Glory! Yeah, I got that. I got it. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, thank God for the Holy Ghost. Where would we be without Him? Lost. Glory to God. You got anything? Hallelujah. Somebody needs to close this. Hallelujah. I got a shout. Oh, yeah. Come on. Hallelujah.
God. Glory to God. Be careful what you hear. Be careful what you hear. Be careful what you read and what you see. Be careful what you hear. His word is truth. His word is the truth. Glory to God. 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 We have a choice. Make the right choice. Make the right choice. Be careful what you hear. Be careful what you see. Refuse to go down the road of fear. Glory to God. 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 Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Glory to God. You know, we just came back from Italy. When we went over to Italy a week ago, there was coronavirus had not hit Italy. By the time we were leaving, it was number three. China, Iran, and Italy for the most number of cases. And you could sense in the atmosphere a spirit of fear in Italy. Spirit of fear. We met a little lady in a coffee shop. She was probably in her late 70s and she had a mask on. But she began to speak to us, talk to us. We said, you, you speak English? She goes, oh yes. So we, we began chatting with her and, and she says, you need, you, you, you know, she was talking about actually the coronavirus. And she says, my mother lived to be 101. And we looked at her before we left and walked out. And we said, we will pray for you that you may live to be 101 like your mother. And she just looked at us and smiled. But the spirit of fear, don't let it get on you. It's a choice. Don't let it get on you. I don't know where this is going in America. Every time I pick up my phone, there's something popping up. Just can't read it all. Just don't read it. Just don't even read it because it will affect you. Don't feed on it. It doesn't matter. It does not matter. What do you believe? You better know what you believe and you better know the truth. I'll say that again. You better know what you believe and you better know the truth. Because if you think that God has anything to do with this coronavirus, you are in trouble. He is not sending it. He has nothing to do with it. There's a good God. There's a bad devil, period. Know what you believe. Know what you believe. Know what you believe. The truth will set you free. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Good word tonight, lovey. Woo! Glory to God. Glory to God. Hey, just one announcement. It's just a reminder for young adults. Young adults. You a young adult? You can be, Pastor Mark says he is. I am too. Hey, uh, single or married, doesn't matter. But Friday night, you're having what they call real talk. Uh, is it over? It's over in the uh, youth building. Come on out. Uh, they did this months, several months ago, and they had a great time. It's just real talk. They're going to be talking about different issues. They're going to be talking about a lot of a lot of different things. But it's just a very comfortable, low key evening. Um, real talk. It's Friday night at 7 p.m. over in the youth building. Come on out, hang out with them. We love you. Let's end our service with what we believe around here. We live by the word. We're led by the Spirit, and we love the world. Hey, and we love you.